2024 has been a very interesting year for gaming. It seems as if almost every month, a brand new game drops out of seemingly nowhere and completely takes over social media, Power World, Helldivers, and most recently, Content Warning. The success of these smaller titles feels bigger than it has ever been. These titles, especially the former two, have been taking over gaming. But why is it happening? Indie successes have existed as long as indie games have been easily accessible, and them blowing up is nothing new. Before Helldivers and Power World, we had Among Us and Fall Guys. And before Among Us and Fall Guys, we had Stardew Valley. Sprinkle in some Super Meat Boy, Phasmophobia, and heck, I mean even Minecraft was originally an indie project. The point is indie games and lower budget titles being awesome is nothing new. However, it's seeming like more and more the mainstream is starting to take to these games which I believe is 100% due to the state of AAA games. In the past year or so, we have seen massive changes in the AAA space, tons of layoffs and even many studios shutting their doors for good. And while some of this can be attributed to the greed or overhiring practices, the simple matter of the fact is that AAA games are getting increasingly more expensive to create. One flop or poorly received game can completely cripple a studio even one that had been healthy for many years. And even a game that does just okay isn't guaranteed to make back its development costs. This has led to what we have seen over the past handful of years in terms of the ways games try to monetize. It truly feels like it's all about profit. Games are becoming more and more monetized to the point that sometimes it feels like we're more just playing an algorithm designed to keep us playing and spend more money on microtransactions rather than, you know, just playing the game and having fun. Just launch up any AAA modern live service game and you'll quickly see what's front and center, the store. In many cases, these additional microtransactions have even taken the place of actual gameplay additions as from a publisher point of view, post-release this is where the big bucks comes from. Games no longer sell you a DLC pack, but instead sell you a skin pack that honestly sometimes can cost more for a single skin or a single pack of skins than an entire DLC map pack did back in the day, which is absolutely insane when you just stop to think about it. This is where our recent blow up of indie darlings comes into play. Rather than feeding you slop in order to get you into their shop, these developers are delivering exactly what gamers want. Dumb fun that you can just enjoy. No worrying about how SBMM is ruining your lobby, or how the season pass is extremely grindy, or how they're trickling out content to get you to come back. Just sit back and enjoy the game and have some fun. And as we have seen, the key to massive success seems to be building these games around playing with a few friends. Outside of the looter shooter live service games, in many cases, AAA gaming has gone away from the co-op experiences and instead focused either just on single player games or a normal multiplayer slash looter shooter model. However, the simple four player co-op PVE style of game, or even just a game that you can casually enjoy with your friends, seems to be completely lost when we look at AAA gaming. Yes, Suicide Squad is a four player co-op PVE game, but if you're real with yourself and you compare that one to one with a Helldivers or a Lethal Company, go ahead and tell me which of these is more fun to play with your friends. And that right there is where it becomes increasingly more clear why some of these smaller titles are blowing up. On the launch for Suicide Squad, I dropped $70 to be able to hop in and play with my buddies, just to end up mostly bored by the gameplay loop and never even reach the end game, or you know, lack thereof. On the other hand, in the past six months, I have also spent that same amount of money on like five to six different smaller projects that all brought me more playtime and a heck of a lot more fun playing with my friends. I dropped $15 on Battlebit, $10 on Lethal Company, $30 on Power World, $40 on Helldivers, and even $8 on Content Warning, though literally that one could have been free if I had just got on and redeemed it. All of these games combined barely cost me more than one AAA title. One AAA title that ended up being a complete dud. And right here is where I think the key to this shift in gaming and market habits is coming from. Not only are these games coming in and bringing us really fun and refreshing experiences, they also aren't that big of an investment. $10 is literally nothing. I mean, in this day and age, you can barely get a meal at McDonald's for that price, so throwing it into Steam for a chance of a few nights of fun with your friends, to me, seems like a no-brainer. And if it ends up fun, you could get a few weeks or maybe even months of fun with your buddies. But if not, like I said, it's $10 instead of 70. Now, do these indie titles go on to last forever? Well, as we have seen, not really. Besides Helldivers, which has probably held its player base the best out of all the titles I've mentioned, most of these titles have hit massive hype and social media waves, hit their player base peaks that were way above what anybody could have expected, and then slowly dwindled off to a much lower, but still respectable number. 
But here's the thing, right? That's totally okay. While many of us would want our $70 live service game to last for many years, when it's a lower cost investment, it doesn't hurt as bad if that doesn't go on forever. Also, let's be real. There's been plenty of $70 live service titles that are dead within a year or two anyways. So it's not like paying that premium up front really guarantees the game is sticking around. Most people are perfectly fine with getting a few weeks or a month of fun from something like Power World and then moving on when they get bored. While gaming media loves a good old X game has lost Y percentage of his players, this really isn't the huge bombshell that these games media websites make it out to be. Although let's be real, sometimes I wonder if they even think it's much of a bombshell or if they just write those articles because they know somebody's going to click on it, which is a whole different issue in gaming. One of the most common comments that I see as someone who has made some Power World videos is, oh my god, who still plays Power World? And in reality, it's a comment that doesn't even make sense. First of all, a ton of people. Recently, it's back over 100k with the recent update, but even if it wasn't, the game sold millions of copies and was a massive success for Pocket Pair, and more importantly, was a very fun game for all the people who enjoyed it. Does Power World get a little bit stale if you put tons and tons of hours into it? Yeah, of course, and I can tell you that firsthand, but this is natural. Power World still sports a respectable player base today, and like I said, recently just dropped a raid, which means there's still new content for that hardcore player base who's been sticking around. But for the millions of players who put their 10 to 40 hours into the game and then kind of just fell off, there is nothing wrong with that. Maybe they'll come back for the full 1.0 release, or maybe they won't. At the end of the day, you don't need Power World to be the next Fortnite. It can just be a memory of a game that you played for a few weeks, had some good times, and then moved on to the next. I mean, hey, if it wasn't for Power World, I wouldn't have wasted money on this beautiful Depresso plush. But okay, okay, that makes sense. These games are doing well because they are designed to just be fun, rather than ways to milk your wallet dry. But why specifically has each of these games gone so nuclear? Well, let's take a closer look. Out of all the games I mentioned, the smallest of them was Battlebit, but this is a game that I absolutely adored last year, and even though it didn't make any Game of the Year lists, was honestly one of the most fun games that I played last year. And why was that? Well, what Battlebit managed to do was bring back that casual, sit back on your couch and BS with your friends and random people style of gameplay that is sorely missed in the multiplayer FPS genre. Though it is a PC only game, so I didn't actually sit on my couch, but you get the point. I am someone who loves FPS games, and I've been playing them religiously religiously for well over a decade now, and if it's been a multiplayer FPS that had any amount of popularity over that time, I probably tried it out. And Battlebit brought back memories of exactly what all the old people like me harp on about, the good old days. I wasn't getting screwed over by SBMM, there wasn't a store with extremely overpriced skins being jammed down my throat, there wasn't a battle pass that made the game feel like a job, it was just a fun FPS game that I could just throw in and enjoy for a few weeks yell at some people in prox chat, have some funny moments, and have a good time. Now did it eventually dwindle off? Yeah, unfortunately the game made by two developers did in fact struggle to get updates out fast enough to keep everyone satisfied, and Battlebits also had a little bit of an identity crisis on what style of FPS it wants to be, between like an arcadey battlefield style game and the more milsim style of games that it took inspiration from, but regardless overall, slowly players begin to fall off the game. But for the month or two that everyone was on Battlebit, bullshitting in proximity chat with their friends, I would say it was well worth the $15 that it cost, and for those developers, literally life-changing money. I might not ever return to Battlebit if we're being honest, but I can easily say that it had a notable impact on my gaming enjoyment last year. Lethal Company would see its peaks toward the end of 2024, and unlike many of the other titles in this video, it wasn't an instant viral hit, but rather a slow burn that built momentum until it hit that point. A simple, and I mean very simple, four player co-op game all about finding random loot while attempting to avoid scary monsters. At the core of it, there really isn't much to the game. But the variety of gameplay scenarios caused by using in-game chat and diving deeper and deeper to get that big score in the name of the good old company had us all compelled to launch it up with our buddies very similar to the successes of Phasmophobia in years prior. Recently this model was almost used to a T with the release of Content Warning. And while this one probably isn't going to end up nearly as big as Lethal Company, it's a fun 4 player co-op experience working with your friends to in this case take some scary videos for Spooktube. 
leading to again tons of fun moments. These moments are what is causing these games to get massive success. And sure, just like Lethal Company prior, this game isn't going to become the next huge gaming IP for years to come, but for less than that McDonald's meal, who really cares? These simple stylized co-op games are fun, and they aren't out to wage war on your wallet. Instead, just provide a simple fun time for as long as you were enjoying it, and then when you're not enjoying it anymore, it's not going to penalize you with FOMO. It also helps that in many cases, these co-op style games lend really well to funny clips that players can share on social media. I'm sure you've seen all of these games all over whatever your social media of choice is, whether it's TikTok, Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts, whichever one you prefer. But this has helped these smaller games gain insane amounts of viral momentum that wasn't possible in years prior. Just seeing clips of people having fun instead of sweating in a multiplayer title, or just staring blankly at their monitor unlocking loot in a looter shooter, laughing, screaming, trolling with your friends, it all plays together into what makes all of these games feel so special, and having people share their genuine fun on all these different platforms just helps these games gain even more momentum. I mean, when you're scrolling through and you see like four or five clips of a specific game, there's that feeling that, hey, you want to experience that game too, and that's how these games can get so big. Back in the day, indie titles were stuck with more traditional marketing. You know, obviously word of mouth with people talking to their friends, or just your standard, you know, long form YouTube videos, or regular you know, marketing and ads and all that stuff, but there wasn't that short form content where people are just scrolling and scrolling that those smaller titles of the past could truly take over. And with that now, it's a totally different gaming landscape. While smaller titles obviously don't have the marketing budgets of these AAA games, what they do have in many cases is just genuine fun. And that genuine fun, like I said, is shown by all these people that are just enjoying the game and posting all the fun that they're having. Whether it's gameplay clips, funny moments, guides, whatever it is, these clips are taking over your For You pages and it just brings these games even more momentum. Power World in recent times saw the biggest peak of these games, hitting over 2 million concurrent players and over like 10 million sales. The game went absolutely bonkers, because again, it's just fun. Take a bit of Ark and a bit of Pokemon, combine it together, and you have a fun survival game that only costs $30. And with a game that takes about 40 hours to get through all of the main content, it's not a bad value bargain at all. And even then, that's not the end. Pocket Pair is still dropping new updates with the recent raid, and a promise of a big content drop this summer, and obviously 1.0 at some point in the future. So why are these games so successful? If you haven't caught my drift yet, there's about four main reasons that these games are popping off. They're reasonably priced, we talked about that, fun over monetization, a feeling of actual community, and last but not least, the one we just talked about, it's just a change in marketing strategies. These four reasons alone are why so many of these games are exploding. Gamers are tired, and they're tired of games feeling like a treadmill each day, or just another job to progress their battle pass. Getting something that is just a game and not some algorithm designed to get every cent out of you has led to the massive successes that we're seeing. It also helps that unlike many modern multiplayer games from AAA studios that almost feel like an isolated lonely experience, all of these games encourage playing with other players and just talking to people. Whether that's your existing friends or just hopping into random lobbies, all of these games are letting you just play online games like they should be played and like they were played back in the day, and that's socially. This though is a feeling that many AAA multiplayer games have lost, as the focus of those is no longer just socially playing games and having fun, but instead it's all about those engagement and playtime metrics, and this is at the cost of those lobbies and those games actually feeling social. But there's obviously one major success that I haven't mentioned yet, and that's Helldivers. Out of all of these games, Helldivers not only seems to have the most staying power, but it also took virality on social media to a new level. Gamers were just sharing their war stories against the automatons or of their last stand to save or retake Malevolent Creek, the camaraderie to spread democracy as you lay down airstrike after airstrike on the bugs. All of this stuff combined is something that took a franchise that was once a niche top-down co-op game to a massive PvE third-person shooter just in one sequel. Out of all of these, Helldivers is the closest to the AAA live service style. While Arrowhead isn't a AAA studio, the game is published by Sony, so even though the budget is a bit smaller, it does have some legitimate backing behind it. And unlike many of the other games, Helldivers does include some of that standard live service monetization, including its form of a battle pass, with Arrowhead also dropping new content on a regular basis to keep people playing. 
The thing is though, when a game is fun and a monetization model is reasonable, it makes the world of difference. While again your favorite gaming publication might have ran an article saying that Helldivers was pay to win, the reality is that's total BS. Not only is the game balanced in a way that it is pretty much playable with the initial unlocks all the way through, everything is earnable just by playing the game. So sure, you can spend some money to unlock a few things a bit quicker, but in a co-op PvE game, that isn't really a big deal as long as unlocking it through normal play isn't made ridiculously grindy. And in the case of Helldivers, it's not. Tons of people have earned all the premium items just by playing the game, and they even have enough of the premium currency ready to buy whatever new things that Arrowhead drops. Monetization has gotten so bad in games that there seems to be backlash against any forms of it these days. But in reality, you really need to analyze these on a case-by-case -case basis. It isn't completely black and white like many make it out to be. I personally am fine with some moderate microtransactions and purchasable content in a game like Helldivers because the developers not only made the model pretty consumer friendly, they have also been updating the game like crazy and dropping new content constantly. To me, this makes their model acceptable, versus something like Halo Infinite that regularly drops new premium overpriced items in the store while basically giving you no developer made content in the last year of the game. And on top of that, there's no way to even earn this premium content. It's either pull out your wallet or you don't get the cool new armor that they're adding. Not every game is the same and not every monetization model is equal. Now don't get me wrong. I still love a good AAA game, and I'm still out here waiting for the next huge AAA multiplayer shooter because don't get me wrong, when those hit, they hit. But the keyword there is it needs to be good, so I hope this trend of AA or indie projects seeing success continues because 2024 has been one of the most refreshing feeling years of gaming in recent years. Last year was the big pop off of single player games, but 2024 so far feels like the year of the co-op title. There is a world where these titles continue to put pressure on the gaming landscape as a whole, and maybe, just maybe, we will finally see some improvements in the AAA space. Or if not, at least we'll get a ton of new games that are pretty fun to play. And maybe if we're lucky, the success of these titles will even convince more talented developers to strike out on their own and just produce more really cool stuff. And that's pretty much the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to give a huge shout out to all the supporters over on Patreon. And yeah, we're back to making video essays, maybe occasionally, though I think the next video will be another challenge video. And with that said, I hope to see you there.